Welcome back to the Build for Life conference. As you might have noticed uh, each uh, morning, I go to London to Marcus Fairs. Hello, Marcus. Hi, Anna. How are Let's you? Let's have our breakfast chit chat again. Yes, we're having a breakfast chit chat. How's the weather in London? We're having a very nice autumn, actually. The, the trees are ablaze with color. It's not too cold, it's not too windy. It's not that sunny, but it's London, so we're not complaining. Mm. Sounds like Copenhagen. And I'm looking forward to your talk today. Uh, are you ready? Uh, yes, of course we're ready. <laughs> we'd be in trouble if we weren't. Today we're going to discuss how we can build more sustainably. How can the techniques we use to construct buildings um, make, make the buildings themselves more sustainable, as well as the lifestyles of the people who live in those buildings, and as well as helping the environment. Mm. And to discuss this topic, I have Suzanne Brawson and Kasper Guldiger, who are both architects, as well as James Drinkwater of the Lord Foundation. First of all, Suzanne, hi to you. Suzanne, Suzanne, can you hear me? Yes, I do. I can't hear you very well, Suzanne. Can you just confirm that oh, you sorry. can hear me? Sorry, yes. Is it better now? Yeah, it's better now. Yeah, it's I better can't better see now. you, but don't worry, we'll carry on chatting. Ah, there you are. Suzanne, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you and what do you do? Um, yes, uh, my name is Suzanne Ross, and I'm uh, the founder of Studio Suzanne Ross, and I'm an architect. Uh, and uh, I have an architectural practice on the island of Rügen in Bergen and also in Berlin. I'm also a researcher at the Technical University in Berlin with a focus on the climate response of architecture in the Baltic Sea region. And I'm currently guest professor in uh, Riga at the Riesebar University. Okay, I'm finding it very difficult to hear you, actually. I kind of got the drift of most of it, but maybe once I speak to the other people, we can try and sort out yes. the audio. I'm going to go to Casper now. Hi there, Casper. Hello. Hi. Thanks for uh, for the invitation. Can you hear me? And how's the sound? I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. A little bit quiet. But Casper, tell us a little bit about yourself as well. Tell us who, who you are and what you do. Yes, as, as you said, I'm an architect by trading, um, but most of my life I've, uh, I've tried to uh, kind of deviate from the classical uh, architectural uh, track. I, I did for 15 years run an innovation company within uh, 3X and Architects, uh, trying to promote uh, innovation and um, research to practice uh, within sustainability. So I've, uh, I'm deeply fascinated with uh, sustainability and materials. And recently, I jumped to the dark side and became a developer. Uh, so now I'm a co-founder of Home.Earth. Um, and we do ethical uh, development, both with a social and environmental uh, pledge. Uh, and I'll be sharing some thoughts on that as well. OK, great and great to meet you. And finally, James, same question to you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Hi, fantastic to be with you. Um, so James Drinkwater, I'm um, calling in from Amsterdam, uh, where I represent the built environment team at the Laudis Foundation. We're a private philanthropic foundation, so architects of another type, creating ecosystems of actors across the private sector, across policymakers, finance, and of course, broader society to help achieve transformational shifts. And we're tackling climate change and inequality as a dual crisis, really two sides of the same coin. Great to be here. Welcome to all of you. I must admit, I'm having trouble hearing you very well, but I think we're just going to carry on and go for it. You've all prepared a little presentation about the work you do and how it relates to the topic we're discussing. So, Suzanne, do you want to go first? If you could share your screen and give us your presentation. Sure. Uh, can you see it? I can see you now, yeah. Hi. OK, super. Uh, yeah, just a very quick introduction. Um, I'm the founder of Studio Susanne Borson, uh, an architectural practice based on the Baltic island of Rügen, not far from Copenhagen, actually, with another base in Berlin. Uh, the reason why I'm showing uh, the location of our office in the context of the Baltic Sea region is that, um, sorry, I cannot for some reason move forward. Now I can see your images, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, that uh, we have a very particular focus, which is the region that we're working in. It's the starting point for our idea what sustainable design should be like, uh, buildings of high architectural quality rooted in the place and able to respond to very particular climate and environmental conditions. 
Uh, for many years, I've been looking into the topic of climate responsive architecture in the Baltic Sea region in particular. And for that, I've carried out extensive research on the molecular buildings in the area. I'm interested in how a local climate and environment has influenced the morphology of several building residential typologies in identifying simple design and construction principles that are still valid and that could be applied today. Um, yes, and I'm also trying to bring the sort of next generation of architects closer to this idea of specific solutions for certain climates and environments. I'm currently guest professor at Bieseboy University in Riga, and this semester we're looking into ideas for co cohabitation as part of a design studio on new housing in Riga. I'm also very much trying to practice what I preach. This is one small project, one of the first projects on the island of Rügen as well. It's a conversion of an existing residential building, which is a so-called series of type buildings that was developed and built in very large amounts pretty much everywhere in former East Germany, so from north to south everywhere. We've added a long wall and a new terrace in between the two existing buildings to form a wind-protected courtyard space that creates a microclimate. Um, this project sort of acknowledges the large potential in this extensive existing building stock and is an example of how it could be reused and brought into another life cycle. Yeah, and on a much more urban scale, we have um, taken part in a competition this year um, together with some offices from Sweden and Denmark. And uh, it's actually a big, big urban space in the center of Berlin. And, and the question was how this could be redesigned to meet challenges connected with climate change. And in this case, Berlin, uh, in a couple of years, will face a climate similar to what Sevilla in Spain is now. So we've proposed a dense forest that can hold a lot of public functions. Um, and yeah, for, for this project, also on the island of Rügen, we've reinterpreted the local development plan and uh, also traditional farmstead layouts from the area. Um, and we have developed three different building typologies that enable a modular approach uh, to design, to optimize planning and construction uh, processes. And we have also produced the binding design guidance that states facade and other surface materials and gives lead details on simple build-ups uh, for the construction of these prefabricated uh, timber buildings. Also in order to ensure a high architectural design quality, which I actually think is the key to sustainable design. Thank you. I'm having real trouble hearing the speakers. Is Casper there? I also had a fallout in the in the sound, but uh, I'm 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 here. I hear you loud and clear. I can hear you now, Casper. Yes. Phew. Okay. Can you yeah, take it away, good. please? <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, my my, um, my my short talk today is uh, is a bit about. Uh, what I think is the most important uh, driver and way to talk about sustainability uh, today. Um, as said, I recently um, uh, co-founded Home.Earth, um, and we do homes that are people and planet positive. Um, and, and we uh, founded Home.Earth uh, to show a new way forward. And we are a, a group of, uh, of, of 19 founders with, with a wide range of uh, experience, but also with a shared passion for the built environment. And, and we, we love uh, what uh, cities and buildings, uh, communities uh, do for us and, and, and how they affect our lives uh, very positively. Um, uh, also, we, uh, we, we then acknowledge that there are uh, matters uh, that the built environment really needs to uh, react to and, um, and address. Like we, uh, we have this dual uh, focuses on, on social inequality, like today we see uh, that uh, real estate uh, are separating uh, people 
people that can and people that cannot afford. And uh, we see that real estate uh, is driving uh, climate change uh, and our planet cannot sustain the way we built. This is, uh, of course, the backside uh, and, and what actually has driven us to take action to, uh, to try and uh, be a new uh, developer uh, in, in the real estate market. On inequality, I mean, this is Copenhagen. Uh, it's a heat map not of temperature, but of the rise of, uh, um, uh, you know, like apartments, apartment value uh, since 92. Uh, it's, uh, it has risen with uh, 667%, leaving a large portion of people out uh, of ability to actually uh, own uh, or, or live uh, in the city. Uh, what uh, we do on the environmental part of it is uh, trying to address that. Uh, I had personally three major um, chapters in, in my um, practice. I uh, was practicing cradle to cradle, uh, inspired by nature, how we can learn from nature to eliminate waste by thinking about ecosystems. Um, like waste uh, is a word you don't find in nature, can we in uh, in the industry, in the mankind uh, ecosystem, uh, develop learnings uh, that can eliminate waste? Then I moved on to circular economy uh, and, and put that into construction. Uh, and I think the circular economy really is trying to make a business focus. Like what is the value of, of, of doing sustainable uh, practice? And, and how can you uh, redesign uh, the way you work uh, and the way you also finance construction. The last uh, chapter is what I will uh, spend uh, my my few minutes uh, on today, is uh, the donut economics, um, which is uh, you can say a, a new uh, model uh, that has this dual uh, focus as we do, with an inner social foundation that we cannot develop buildings if we don't do it uh, in a social ethical way. And also the outer ring, like the planetary boundaries, we need to understand what are the real thresholds for the planetary boundaries. Uh, what are the effects and, and how is our space to operate uh, uh, when we have to respect that? So in short, uh, with Cradle to Cradle, I developed ways to actually measure this. Uh, and with uh, the circular economy, it's not just about recycling, it's about focusing on value that we actually want our buildings to become material banks that we can remanufacture their parts or even reuse them uh, or just make uh, smart and flexible buildings that are easy to maintain. The donut for construction uh, is uh, really talking about creating a full transparency on um, carbon, on impact. And uh, on the top, we have a normal kind of life cycle analysis. On the lower part, we have what's called um, absolute environmental sustainable assessment, where we actually say what are the limits for the planets uh, and, and how can we stay within those, which is a, a far more ambitious uh, target than what we have today in Denmark at least. Um, so the question that we are asking ourselves is what if every single building made the world a better place? Um, so Inspired by the uh, Kate Raworth uh, Donut Economics, we have uh, developed and are uh, on a journey on, 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 uh, on finding a way to take those kind of global planetary goals and make them relevant to the industry and also uh, able to practice them per square meter. Like what is the footprint? What is a, a, a kind of a... a what is the limit to the resources, uh, to uh, to the climate, to the biodiversity? And at the same time, uh, when you look at the inner um, of the right circle, to create affordable, healthy, livable and inclusive communities. This is our first project uh, we are uh, currently conducting in uh, the outskirts of Copenhagen, where we bought a plot uh, that has a obligation to create uh, retail and community in the base uh, floor, which per perfectly suits our uh, ambition. We want to have residential and community uh, hand in hand. In this, we have uh, three major promises on the environmental uh, part. We want to build uh, climate positive, meaning that at the end of the day, uh, we should prepare uh, documentation so we actually account for the impact of our building and how uh, we, within that impact, uh, stay within the planetary boundaries. 
so it actually becomes true sustainability. I think maybe that's that's the only thing I really want to take out of this input is that sustainability. It shouldn't be a kind of a subjective matter. It shouldn't be about how you uh, uh, interpret it. It should be how it relates to the planetary boundaries. Otherwise, it's not sustainable. On top of that, we want to increase the biodiversity and we want to uh, build buildings so uh, they are uh, potentially uh, bits and parts for future constructions. So everything is designed uh, to be reused, uh, to become flexible uh, and uh, a part of a circular economy. Beyond that, uh, tons of things that I can't go into, uh, but uh, things that are supporting the environmental and the social uh, dual focus we have. So that's that's my input for today. Look forward for the discussion. Thank you very much. And thankfully, now the audio has been sorted, so I was able to hear most of your talk there, Casper. This concept of, of donut economics, um, it's interesting that you've applied that to to architecture. But could you, anyone who's for anyone who's not familiar with the term, can you explain what donut economics are, and then we can talk about how that relates to the built environment? Yeah, sure. I think what's interesting is that it builds on science. Uh, the Stockholm Resilience Center uh, is a, a group of 250 scientists in, in Stockholm uh, that uh, over the past 10 years have uh, put limits to what the planet uh, can um, can live up to, uh, what it takes uh, for the planet to be in balance, what it can regenerate. Uh, so we know this by Earth Overshoot Day, when we actually are using more resources than the Earth uh, can obtain and regenerate. So, so it's actually putting uh, that number into practice. Um, that's outside of the donut. Uh, and then uh, the hole in the middle is uh, kind of... Uh, we can only uh, construct and uh, and be on the planet if we do it in a social, um, uh, you can say like fair way. So it's also putting limits to how we uh, adopt uh, to, uh, to to social environment uh, performance. And there are so many different buzzwords floating around at the moment. We've got donut economics, circular economy, cradle to cradle regenerative architecture, reversible architecture, and then, of course, on top of that, the kind of carbon agenda and the, the, the push towards net zero um, construction. Um, are they all the same thing? Do they relate to each other? Can you achieve all of those things at the same time, or do you have to choose which, which buttons am I going to press with this project? I think they, they are connected. Uh, to me, at least, they are uh, very strongly. Um, I also wanted to try and underline that uh, connection in, in the input I gave. Uh, cradle to Cradle is really about uh, having the right mindset. It's about uh, redesigning the way we make things in order for things not to become waste. Uh, circular economy is uh, trying to find the business models in that. And the donut economics uh, are putting the right limit values uh, in order to measure it. So uh, so, so to me, it's, it's a, a perfect... Uh, um, a kind of a evolution of, of how to uh, talk about what uh, I call absolute sustainability. Uh, so not relative uh, sustainability, to, but absolute sustainability. And obviously your, your architecture, your practice is dedicated to getting all of this right. But what would your advice be to, to people who are doing more traditional architecture, more extractive architecture, architecture that actually does damage the planet and maybe doesn't give people the, the best lifestyle when they're living in the buildings. How can they start to, to, to move towards what kind of the kind of stuff you're talking about? Well, I think um, we are in the same boat because we are also, um, as a, a developer, I mean, we're engaging with many architects uh, in order to, uh, to carry out our projects. And, and it's about uh, creating a, a baseline uh, finding out uh, how do you, uh, what do you measure, and how do you measure, um, and 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 the the what is 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 really about uh, talking about carbon. I would say is is the easiest currency uh, when you need to go in this to this direction, and 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 what and, and how you do that is is currently through a life cycle analysis. So you need to work with materials that are documented um, uh, through certifications or uh, or EPDs. So so 
it's it's really just to create an informed level of uh, decision making, and then also of course uh, setting um, a target that that you want to be able to have this transparency, and you want to be able to take those informed choices. I mean, I did do a project that were uh, carried out with the promise of 90% of all the materials should be able to be reused at a high value in the future. And it was a social housing scheme. So it was done with a low square meter price. So it is possible today. We just need to know what we ask uh, in the beginning and, and also how to measure it. And final question for you for now. Um, in, the, in where the area you live, are there regulations that are helping you achieve these things or do you feel like you're constantly fighting the government and fighting the authorities in order to achieve these goals? Uh, there's a bit of fight because, I mean, we, we want to um, s s set higher targets than what currently is um, is mandatory. But I also see a development, a positive development. I mean, uh, at the EU level, uh, we have uh, uh, the levels, uh, which is a new way to actually document sustainability. We are complying to that. And we actually find a great inspiration in that. Uh, and that affects all uh, member states of, of the EU. Uh, and in, the, in Denmark, we have... Uh, um, a voluntary sustainability class uh, that makes you like uh, go beyond uh, uh, the mandatory uh, targets. Uh, and also we have a strong movement uh, on uh, sustainable building certifications. Uh, so I think one final thing is that we shouldn't forget, uh, I mean, often sustainability becomes very technical. Uh, and I think also, I think the Velux uh, focus with the compass, uh, it, it has to be uh, about people uh, and uh, something that you experience as well. So, so it cannot only be technical. You also need to remember the quality for the people uh, with, the, with the indoor comfort, with the nature. Um, so I think... Let's not forget that uh, becoming really technical and, and just talking about numbers. Thank you very much, Casper. Just a quick message to Suzanne. Suzanne, I'm going to ask you if you could do your presentation again after James, if that's OK, because I think it's, right, sure. it's only fair that I get a chance to, to hear that. We'll go to James <laughs> first, but hopefully they can fix the audio so I can go back to you after James. I wanted to flag that to you now so it doesn't come as a surprise when I ask All you right. Good later. Time. And I actually can hear you much better now, which is great. I'll come back to you in a second. OK, James, over to you then. Could you share your screen with us and give us your presentation, please? Fantastic. I'm, I'm told in the background, magically built by nature will uh, appear on your screen. And there it is. Um, and fantastic to hear our last speaker, who I think is questioning some of the kind of the root causes of some of our issues in the built environment, looking kind of at what we really need and the best way to do things. And I, I think we need to build from that point. But I'm, I'm here to talk about a new network and fund that the Laudes Foundation has, has just launched, Built by Nature, which is really kind of encompassing this theme of how do we move to, to beyond extractive to, to regenerative in our built environment. Um, for me, it, there's been a really big wake up call because we've been you know, advocating the built environment represents nearly 40% of all carbon emissions. So it's a big part of the opportunity for climate mitigation. But the science demands we don't just reduce emissions, we've got to remove a hell of a lot of this stuff from the atmosphere. And, and arguably, if, if we've created 40% of the climate issue, um, we really now need to work with nature, which is our strongest tool to get on that negative emissions track. We know the science says that forests offer our best hope. And so we've started in, in the work that we're funding at the Laude Strategy to really join a strategy that, that sits across forests and buildings and responds to the needs of forest communities. I've just come from COP26, spent the week discussing with forest communities who are saying, we know how to manage these beautiful resources, the best way for biodiversity and climate. We're desperate for clients who want our wood, who want to procure things that will provide us with the economic means to properly look after these, the, the, these imp important resources. And I can see that the slides uh, perhaps are, aren't moving on. So if we just move the slide to the next slide, um, Again, this is this idea that, that we've started to, 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 to really try to accelerate at Built by Nature, and the slides aren't moving on, but there we go, um, around the need to accelerate the right kind of timber construction. We're starting to see, particularly strong in the Nordics, that the sector's starting to look to substituting high carbon materials like steel, cement, with timber. But it's not taking this broader view of actually, what is what does timber beyond business as usual mean? To get this right, for forests and, and climate smart forest economies so that when, we, when we're sourcing timber, we're making sure we're improving the sequestration 
capacity of forests. As a, as a sector procuring from those forests, we're doing that in the right way and creating those demand incentives to drive reforestation. And that that carbon storage piece, we've just heard from our friend about this, the need to embrace a circular economy. But as we, as those trees sequester carbon during their life, and then we start to put them into our buildings and our cities, it's really critical that we're storing that carbon safely for a very long time. So our average building life of 42 years is, is nowhere near enough, and we need to, to be designing these buildings and, and timber beams and whatnot for their second and third life here. But we've really optimized the whole of this industry for the wonder materials of the Industrial Revolution. So the way that regulations, the way the design and build process works, all the knowledge um, in the sector is not optimized around timber and bio-based materials, natural materials. It, it's really optimized for, for again, these, these, these materials that went through their own industrial revolution some time ago. So we need this demand stimulus. And, and as we start to build more with natural materials in timber and, uh, and bio-based, it's not just about just endlessly building more meters squared. It's about looking at what the North Star needs to be to really optimize across that sequestration piece. So really looking at the forests and how we build with and for forests. It's looking at that carbon storage piece. Are we safely storing the carbon that's then locked up in these materials for, for, for many generations? And it's about that substitution effect. What are the right mix of materials for our, our buildings here? So. We've started a movement through Built by Nature that's working with some of the innovators across Europe and then hopefully the world who started to already look beyond the day-to-day -day, uh, of how we deal with low carbon in the sector towards this more regenerative focus. And we've looked at the actors who can both really drive demand for this new kind of, of building, but also with whom we need to work most closely to create the right safeguards for nature to again, raise the bar on sourcing, make sure FSC is, is everywhere, but, but even go beyond that to say, actually, how do we source as we, as we aggregate demand through developers and cities for timber and bio-based housing? How do we do that in ways that over the coming decades drives the right kind of forest and woodland and the right kind of biodiversity there? So we're working with these big six stakeholders to drive demand, but really ensure that we're thinking all the way through to the forest as we do this. And Built by Nature as an organization, it's really a network that's there to connect those front runners, those, those, those kind of real uh, visionaries of the, the regenerative building movement. It's there to enable them. So getting the, the research, the know-how out there about the right ways to do this, looking more holistically across that carbon cycle and overcoming some of the regulatory barriers that are built into our systems. And it's amplifying what's possible because, you know, there's a classic story in England, the three little pigs, the first made its house of straw and that natural material was terrible. You know, uh, there's a need to change perceptions to show what's possible uh, and to amplify those those narratives. And um, indeed, you can do this today. And the fund, the accelerator fund that has been set up by Built by Nature is there to enable teams to be built who can build real solutions that can scale in this regenerative building space. So we're delighted to be working with a, a real range of some of the best partner organizations out there from the Bauhaus to Erde who've inspired the European Bauhaus movement to the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance and Climate Kick, deeply working with cities to start to scale these new techniques. Some of the best researchers at the, 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 at the, the, the University of Cambridge and our friends in the Cities for Forests platform, which is bringing together faraway forests and cities showing that if we procure wood the right way, it doesn't just cut down trees. Actually, this is what forest communities need to be able to sustainably manage their land. It's actually, it can be a driver over the coming decades for reforestation. A fantastic range of front runners from, from giants, the kind of the, the, the lend leases and Arabs of the world to startups uh, have joined us in this, this movement to really shift and raise the bar. And we're building through Built by Nature, strong national networks, of those big six front runners and broader communities, bringing that forest, those forest networks, the environmental NGOs, policymakers, and so on, really together into an unstoppable movement, really raising the bar on how do you do this and how do we innovate uh, to consistently improve this as a climate solution and making everything real from demonstrations to actually working with cities like my now home city of Amsterdam. They want to do 20% of all housing in timber and bio-based materials as part of their circular economy strategy. But the how has yet to become clear. So working with all these industry, political research and other players to, to, to really chart a clear pathway to starting to change the nature of the way we build cities and connect those back 
to forest. Again, a lot of the work will, will have to focus on removing those regulatory barriers we face today and strategic communications, because changing perceptions and changing that narrative, helping people understand that actually carbon removal is a job for our built environment. These, these, these involve a, a kind of a switch of the current dominant narrative. Again, we're trying to enable this. So as a philanthropic funder, Built by Nature is set up with an accelerator fund uh, that is there to really pull resources into, into this new revolution in the sector, start to build teams, start to seed fund the kind of solutions that can push things further, whether that's circular uses of timber, proper sourcing, it's looking at how do you scale the use of these in housing uh, schemes in cities in Europe that, that don't adopt timber today, so that people don't have to always be the first. It's really about kind of setting a clear innovation pathway now to see these kind of regenerative buildings move from niche to norm. So that fund is there to give out grants, to build teams of brilliant researchers, brilliant front runner companies and, and others um, to, to really move this agenda forwards. And because we are all ecosystems, we are part of nature. This is this is very much the idea of this this new organisation, its fund and and the ecosystem of partner organisations, of cities, of industry players that it's supporting. It's looking to bring that into a much more thriving, much more robust ecosystem that can flip things and really start us to move on a pathway towards more regenerative buildings now. So. It's clear that we're focused on that aggregation of demand, but as we aggregate demand, it's very clear that we have to be incredibly careful about how we work with and for nature. So we're absolutely centering forests. What does a climate smart forest economy look like as we're starting to scale timber? Trying to be relentlessly practical. And of course, the future is a hybrid of all sorts of bio-based materials and hopefully clean steel and low carbon cement, all these things are needed at the, the table. But it's, it's, it's going to be a difficult journey to shift perceptions, provide the solutions we need, and, and we're there to focus on what's hard. So great to be here with such fantastic speakers. I'm sure there's fantastic people in the audience already moving this way and, and, and built by nature. This new organization is very much there to support. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Um, a quick question for you. We often at Zine receive um, projects from architects who claim that because it's made of timber, it's therefore a zero carbon building because you cut down the trees, you lock that carbon in the building. Um, that seems to me a little bit simplistic because um, first of all, how long is that carbon going to remain in the building? You mentioned that in your talk. And what about also what about replacing those trees that were cut down in the first place. If you cut down a forest and there's a just leave a desert, you haven't really done much for the environment. So how, what, what are the parameters, like? what are the rules, what are the kind of things you need to look out for in order to be able to claim you've got a zero carbon building through the use of timber? Sure, and, and that, that difficulty, some of the, you know, we, we are trying to raise the bar here and challenge just the, the status quo. So, you know, there are great sustainable forestry certifications, the FSEs and things out there that, that look at how do you properly manage a forest as you're sourcing from it? How do you ensure those replanting schemes? But let's, let's look a bit further. If we start to shift towards a circular bioeconomy en masse, so we'd move all these fossil-based products to, to timber and bio-based products, we could overshoot the carrying capacity of nature in our forests. So it's it's really clear this isn't just about timber buildings in a silo. This is about a whole shift of the economy towards more regenerative behavior. And timber for use in construction is is one of the best uses of that that precious biomass that that we can we can put it to in that transition to a net zero economy. That means we need to prioritize. We can't simply switch everything. Uh, and, and, and kind of ask nature to provide us with all, all of the solutions. So we need to be very joined up across sectors. And I think that point around, if it's just made of timber, well, if the building's made of timber and then it's around for 40 years and it's decommissioned, we can't be very clear how that carbon is gonna be stored in the second and, and third life so that really it's locked in there for generations. The claim about this, this fantastic carbon storage technology, the oldest, the oldest that, that, that's around, it fails. So that, that point that our previous speakers made around embracing the circular economy, really kind of designing for, for, for reuse, this is really, really critical as well. And as we're, as we're aggregating demand, again, it's not just enough to say, okay, well, we'll, we'll source using a certification. We've got to, as, as kind of groups of developers, cities, investors, and others, start to work very deeply to say, how are we creating the right economic incentives for these, this push on reforestation? and proper management of biodiversity. This is going to require a kind of a, a coordination that goes beyond just single 
projects here. So, so I think, you know, whilst it is clear that versus the status quo, a switch to biobased often is lower carbon, um, that, 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 that's pretty provable. If we really want to scale this, we've got to raise the bar. And again, we use that 3S framework, the sequester, store and substitute. Let's not just focus on that last bit, but the carbon impact across the board, that's what's key. Okay, thank you so much, James. Right, I'm going to go back to Suzanne now. And um, I've been asked if you could give a kind of quick recap of your talk, Suzanne, because apparently the, all, the audience were able to hear what you're saying, but I wasn't. So it's largely for my benefit, if that's okay. But if you could do like a, a quick run through. Your talk, was quite, uh, your talk was quite quick anyway, so this shouldn't take too long. But I'd love to hear what you were presenting. Super, but, it, but you can hear me now. I can hear you now. It's not perfect, okay. but I can at least understand. At least it's English <laughs> rather than Mars <Mild> language. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Just a just a quick introduction. Uh, I'm uh, the founder of Studio Susanna Borsen, an architectural practice based on the Baltic island of Rügen and Bergen, and also with a branch in Berlin. Um, the reason why I'm showing um, this, the location of our offices in the context of the Baltic Sea is that. Our uh, work has a very particular focus, which is the region that we're working in. And it's the starting point for our idea what sustainable design should be like, uh, buildings of high architectural quality, um, rooted in the place and able to respond to very particular climate and environmental conditions. Um, for many years now, I've been looking into the topic of climate responsive architecture in the Baltic Sea region, and for that I've carried out actually extensive research on vernacular buildings in the area. I'm interested in how local climate and environment has influenced the morphology of several residential typologies and identifying simple and, and construction principles um, uh, that are still valid and could be applied today. Um, I'm also trying to bring the sort of next generation of architects closer to this idea of specific solutions for certain climates and environments. And I'm currently guest professor at Riesebar University in Riga. And this semester, for example, we're looking into ideas for a new neighborhood, for cohabitation as part of a design studio on new housing in Riga. I'm also very much trying to practice what I preach with my studio. This is one small project, one of the first projects also on the island, it's a conversion of an existing residential building, which is a so-called series or, or a type building that was developed and built in large amounts pretty much everywhere in former East Germany. And so it exists uh, everywhere from north to south. And we have added, in this case, added a long wall and a new terrace in between the two existing buildings to form a wind protected courtyard space that creates a microclimate. And this project acknowledges the large potential of this extensive building stock um, and is an example of how it could be reused and brought into another life. Uh, and uh, another example on a very urban scale, um, we have participated in this competition this year um, and have become finalists. It's an existing urban space in the center of Berlin, close to the TV tower. And uh, the question was how it could be redesigned to meet the challenges connected to climate change. And in this particular case, Berlin in a couple of years is facing a climate similar to what Sevilla and Spain is now. So we've proposed a dense forest that can hold a lot of public um, outdoor functions in it. And the last project um, is, is this uh, eco-village. Uh, it's also on the island of Rügen, and we have reinterpreted a local development plan and also looked into traditional farmstead layouts in the area and have come up with a scheme that arranges several buildings into three-sided courtyards and it's in this case also connecting to an existing village um, next to it. And we have developed three different building typologies that enable a modular approach in design to optimize planning and construction processes. Um, we have produced a binding design guidance actually that states facade and other surface materials and gives lead details on the simple build-ups for the construction of these prefabricated timber buildings and in order to ensure a very high architectural quality as well, um, which I actually think is the key to sustainable design. Thank you. Thank you very much and I'm glad we got to hear what you were saying. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left, so I think I'd like to open it up now to a bit of a discussion. I'd like to ask all of you, um, 
I think it was you, James, that mentioned that you'd been at COP26, but we've just had this massive climate conference. What did all of you think with the outcome of COP26 was, and particularly in relationship to the built environment? Did it deliver enough? Did it deliver anything? Let me start with you, Suzanne, since you've just been speaking. I think it is uh, very important that these uh, uh, events take place. Um, I haven't quite get my, got my head around to think what it will actually mean, for example, for my work. Um, I, will see, I will see that. I think that calls have been out from the, the German Architects Chamber on rethinking building regulations and, and uh, how we can deal, for example, with existing buildings and how we can re reconstruct, re reuse them and make it much easier uh, to do so. So I think there's, there's things uh, coming out of that already and I think that's very important. Thank you very much. And James, you were there. What was it like? And, and did you come out of it with a sense of optimism or like a, <laughs> a you, you, big depression? You've got to be a stubborn optimist in this business, haven't you? I mean, I, I think, you know, listen, COP17 was about the first time buildings were ever on the agenda and, you know, half the room were asleep. 21, COP21 in Paris, the first ever buildings day, but it's sort of a little bit more energy efficiency, please, was the mantra. But I, I do have a sense of optimism because, you know, it, we heard mayors, we heard NGOs, we heard ministers, heads of companies saying we need to move to tackle whole life cycle carbon. So we're talking about the total climate impact of the sector, kind of bonkers that we weren't before. Um, and we saw, you know, Pacific coasts in the US and, uh, and the UK and Canada, Germany and others starting to say in our public projects, we're going to start to assess the, the total uh, carbon impacts of our, our buildings. So, because we need everyone to do everything, it's never going to be enough. And that's ultimately why we need regulation, but it's, we're starting to hear the right noises now. And I, I hope we do actually start to see a real kind of, you know, set of rocket boosters put on the agenda. Thank you very much. And Casper, same question to you. Yeah. Yeah, well, I weren't there, and I also think it's uh, it's more than an arm, arm length from uh, you know like a, an average person. What's what happens at the COP? I mean, it is a kind of a political beast, and um, and, and I think there's a lot of frustration uh, with uh, with the slowness of that beast. So uh, so I respect uh, and and also see the progress, uh, but but there needs to be a wake up call uh, because it's quite clear that uh, science is saying that that. This is not going to be, uh, you know, uh, the the cause uh, to steer if if we want to have a stable world and a, a stable societies. Um, so, so I think it's it's uh, it's it's so political that it makes me want to like as an individual to take action. Uh, like, what is my own consumption? What is my own contribution to uh, to a positive uh, uh, path? And also, I think we see that happening uh, with. Um, a lot of private initiatives, like like our own uh, in the construction industry, but uh, many, many other, like in, in, in everything that you connect to. I mean, you are starting to be able to take choice. Um, I think maybe the biggest choice is that I see a lot of uh, pension funds now start to offer, you know, like uh, deep green uh, investment possibilities. So I think I think we'll see a, a real big accelerating shift uh, when it comes to uh, consumerism and where people um, uh, put their mouth uh, because that's what needs to change the, the whole way we consume the whole way we kind of construct uh, and and it's not gonna change with the cop i think it will change between the cops and and uh, that's at least what i'm hoping for and also i see the possibilities uh, are starting to emerge that you actually can act on it Thank you very much. Okay, next question to all of you is, um, I mean, James talked a lot about timber, but also there are all kinds of other natural materials out there. There are all kinds of other alternative materials out there. What to you do you think are the exciting um, possibilities, both in terms of materials that can be used to build buildings and the techniques that can be used to build buildings? What's, what's around the corner or what could help us lower the uh, lower the impact of our buildings. Suzanne, have you got any um, things that are on your radar that you, you have been using in your projects or would like to be using, or even <coughs> things that, that have not been developed yet but look promising for the future? 
Yes, yes, of course. I think there's a lot of very interesting things happening. I would like to add to one comment that Casper uh, um, made before. Uh, I think it is very interesting that there is regulations, but I have had the experience that it's very much clients who come in and are much more willing uh, to, to look into more radical approaches. We want to build very, very sustainable and even uh, much more sustainable than the current regulations are asking for. So I have the feeling that even from the client side, there's lots of things on the move, and I find that very exciting. Um, and it's also these clients who, who come with a lot of products, and, and there is a lot of information available on the internet, and they're doing research themselves and find out about things like, could we not do like a combination of straw, hay, uh, clay, uh, that, this and that. And I think it's it's very exciting that, um, that that we are maybe in the, there's a moment now where we can start to experiment with things. Of course, I think that there's a little bit of a risk, of course, and maybe we need to be willing to take that risk to test what could be done, and we will learn from that. Uh, maybe some things don't work, maybe we have to combine it with established systems. Uh, but I'm, I'm quite, um, I think that there's lots of things happening now and um, I'm, I'm personally trying to, I'm working a little bit with uh, local nature materials and trying to come up with some facade systems. <laughs> so that's what I'm, I'm, I'm experimenting with myself. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot going on. And it's interesting that you said that clients can help you get there. Lots of architects I speak to say, well, clients are the problem actually, that they don't want to take risks, they don't want to innovate, um, they like the idea of being sustainable, but not if it damages their profits. Do you not find that? And, and who are these clients? Because I think a lot of the audience would like to know who they are. <laughs> I think that there's maybe in this particular place, it's a tourist region, and some of the project developers have found out that um, when people go on holiday, there's a certain market demand that people would like to stay in a, a good building, in a sustainable place, and uh, that, that is actually for them something they can, um, um, which is something they can promote very much. And I have had two clients now who are specifically asking for, uh, we need to do something very sustainable here. We want to have a car sharing scheme. We want to have this and this and that. Um, and I think that there is a market that, that is happening there. And also clients who think that they can maybe build more simple, who don't want so much technical appliances, who want to think that building has become too complicated maybe even um, on the sort of private residential sector. And I think it's coming a little bit from that corner as well. Sounds like you're very lucky where you live. Sounds like some kind of paradise. Same question no. to, to you, Kat. <laughs> Same question. But apart from the fact that you have bad Wi-Fi there, so I can't really hear you that well. Apart from that, it sounds like a dream. Kasper, same question to you. What are the materials and technologies and techniques that are emerging that will help us deliver the kind of buildings we've been talking about? Yeah, no, uh, I think we have a, a massive uh, climate crisis, but also a, 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 a housing crisis uh, at scale. So we, we need a lot of uh, homes um, and we need to do that uh, with respect for the earth. So I think we cannot uh, invent uh, kind of uh, new materials. Uh, there's a lot of, I self, myself been involved with uh, upcycling and making new kind of mycelium based uh, building components, but, but we need to look at, at scaling the solutions. So I think, um, as as um, as we heard, like the the bio based uh, path is is really uh, an important one, but we need to find one at scale, uh, and also we need buildings that can last. Uh, and we, uh, us as a developer, we are that client uh, that that we mentioned, but we are of course uh, taking care of investments uh, from um, uh, our investors. So so we need to document uh, the the kind of the the safety of that investment. So we can't just do one big experiment. But it's my learning from commercial, uh, industrial uh, available materials. Uh, we can make buildings that we can take apart and reuse over and over. We can we can drive down carbon. We just need we need that kind of perspective on it. We need that uh, transparency, um, so we can make the right choices. Uh, we will still have uh, steel. We will still have a concrete. Um, 
I think we need a shift towards much more bio-based uh, and uh, and look for the, the the scalable solution, not just reinventing or inventing new things uh, because the solutions are out there. Um, it's it's just important that we 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 know that it's a, a industry that that uh, you know like requires a lot of approvals, a lot of the verifications. So so I'm I'm more looking to what what's out there and how we can scale that up and and how we can have carbon transparency on it. Thank you very much. The same question to you, James. Um, and I'd like to hear as well, at, uh, I mean, cutting down a tree, slicing it up and building a house out of it is kind of an ancient ancient way of doing things, isn't it? It's, it's sustainable. But are, are there new timber technologies in the offing? I mean, so much of a tree gets wasted, doesn't it, when you convert it from a growing tree into a, a few planks? I mean, I've heard that three quarters of the tree ends up being wasted. So are there technologies that are making tim forestry more efficient and timber being more high tech, for example? Sure, it's, it's a great call out. And the last point around, we really need to scale mass timber. Um, you know, mass timber to many, I think is still a new technology. You know, the, the idea of engineered timber, and it's not this rickety 18th century stuff that burns, it's, you know, Michael, Dr. Michael Ramage and his colleagues at the University of Cambridge have shown in, in concept is how, how, how you could do, you know, as much as 80 stories in, in mass timber. We're still getting there. And I think you're right to call out that point around efficiency. We're working with groups in Switzerland who are working on exactly that same question. How do you make sure we use 100 percent of the tree? Some of that for kind of structural use in, in, in mass timber, some of that you know, for, for other uses in, in kind of composite bio-based materials uh, and so on. And, and, and I think that that efficiency is really key to the climate story here. And um, again, groups in Spain we're working with are looking at that digital technology that can track how you're harvesting the right trees at just the right time in their life cycle where they've, they, they've kind of stopped sequestering as much carbon, turning those into timber being hyper efficient and ensuring, as our colleague was saying, you're starting to tag those those assets so that they can be reused beyond their initial life in, in, in the first building they go into. So we need to pair, you know, the brilliance of, of new technologies with some of the oldest technologies we've got. As you say, construction's been around for a while, but but certainly modern mass engineered uh, timber construction. This, this is what's really brought it into the 21st century. Thank you, James. There's a lot of audience questions for you, but um, just to make it fair to the other panelists, I'm only going to ask you one of them. Lothian asks, in the next 30 years, more than one billion people in Africa will need a house. Is all the timber in the world enough for that demand of material? And I guess we can broaden it beyond Africa. Is there enough wood to do uh, all of the construction that we need it to do? And is there enough will to also replant all those trees? I think it's a really is there enough land as well? <laughs> Sure. I mean, I think land competition for land, right? If we, unless we change the way we do agriculture, unless we look at really the need of how much we're building, um, we'll, we'll overshoot. That's really key. So we have to be addressing some of these root causes. And whilst I'm not personally an expert in African forestry, I don't think in Built by Nature we're saying we need to switch from what we do today, which is pretty, pretty climate, climate negative, as it were, um, to, to all timber. There's going to be a hybrid of solutions that are needed. This fantastic, you know, African construction, rammed earth, you know, that's that's often a more sustainable in certain areas um, solution. So it's not always about timber, but in those areas where actually that long term demand for a higher value use of wood that's longer life, it stores carbon for longer, can help provide forest communities with a livelihood and drive reforestation over the coming decades. It's that analysis we need looking at, again, land use competition for it and, and where that housing demand is going to come from. So there's no silver bullet solutions. We're not saying that timber's that. OK, great. And I think we've got time for one uh, quick question. Anonymous asks and says, great presentations, everybody. So thank you very much, Anonymous, for the feedback. Do we need to change the shapes and forms and designs and scales of the architecture we, we, we do in order to be, to be able to build in harmony with nature? Casper, can you respond to that quickly, like in 20 seconds? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I think we need to uh, look way more industrialized uh, towards uh, uh, buildings as products. Um, and we need to have products that are uh, able to have many lifetimes and many uses. So a, a real kind of a industrialized way to scale this up. So we build with components that are uh, standards and then be smart with those standards through design and architecture. But but build buildings so they are you know, like a, a material inventories for, for future buildings. 
Thank you very much. And Suzanne, do you have an equally short answer to that question? Does, does the nature of architecture need to change? I think that uh, I think that um, there is always a sort of need to look into. That's what I think into specific challenges in one place. I think we there won't be a generic solution to to uh, to new housing or new timber buildings or how uh, it's done. But maybe I think that there is a, there is a thing certainly about optimizing and simplifying things so more people can benefit from that. I think that's that's uh, a very interesting approach. I think that we can establish maybe a system how a building can work and then this system is maybe a bit elastic. So so we can make it match to several places and, and extend it and, and so forth. I think that's that's quite interesting. Thank you very much. And I think we all need to come and live on your island. I think that would be a, a better world for everybody if there's enough room for us. Thank you very much, everybody. Handing back to you now, Anna. I hope you can hear me OK. Thank you, Marcus. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. Thank, thank you very much. It's been, thank it's been great working with you. I'm going to miss you as my <laughs> breakfast conversation each day. Thank you very so much for inviting us to be part of this amazing conference. You're very welcome, Dave, uh, Marcus, and I'm also going to miss our little uh, morning chit-chat between London and Copenhagen, but fantastic uh, talk you had, and uh, I hope to see you or talk to you again another day. Thank you very much. See you again. Bye.